Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, our November Fellows event. Um, and we're delighted this evening to have um, Deirdre, um, Deirdre Lang, who um, initially trained in St Vincent's Hospital, Ellen Park, as a registered general nurse, and during the early part of her career, worked in both Australia and in Ireland. Um, she was awarded a fellowship of, by examination from the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery in 2017. She has a variety of experiences in healthcare and having worked in mental health and um, in practice development in the nursing midwifery planning development, she's managed government projects and um, recruitment initiatives across a number of Irish health services providers and in Spain. Um, she feels that she has provided um, with a very strategic view of the health services. Her experiences in older persons is what we're going to hear about tonight. So I'd like to welcome Deirdre to the, the stage to present. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm really honoured and um, it's a privilege to be able to stand here and speak to so many wonderful people about what is my favourite subject. So we're going to talk about ageing and I have put hashtag my future older self because I want us to consider it from our own perspective. I'm going to bring you on a journey. It's obviously not Ireland because the sun's shining. <laughs> In order to bring you on this journey, I need to set context. So in front of you, there are post-its. What I want you to do is take a pen and paper and I want you to write down the year that you will be 65. <laughs> so for the people to, in front of me, that will be when I'm dead. But <laughs> So write down the year you're going to be 65. Have you got that? Catherine's counting. <laughs> Thomas has, hasn't had any sleep, so it'll take him a bit. Probably 2025 would it be? No? Okay, and when you've got that, I want you to then write down on the se a separate post-it the year you're going to be 80. Okay, so those dates will be relevant to you as we go through this presentation. So, we're going to talk first about the year 2025. And I just want you to look at the world map. And you can see that in 2025, the percentage of people over 60 in Ireland will be between 10 and 30 percent. So for some of us, we will be in that category. So this slide is busy, but it's important because it shares a lot of information with us. So let's look at birthdays. In 1926, men lived till they were nearly 57 and a half. And in 2046, they're going to live till they're 85. Women in, 19, in 2046 will live till they're 88 and a half. So in 2046, our population is going to be roughly 6.7 million. In 2026, 860,700 of the population will be over 65. But if you look at 2046, that will have grown exponentially to 1.4 million people. To the left of that again, are the over 80s. So in 2011, we have 128,000 people over 80, but let's push through to 2046, where we're nearly have half a million people over 80 years of age. So 2046 is a year that probably means a lot to a lot, uh, means a significant amount to a lot of us in relationship to ageing. And if you just look at the population that's going to enter the workforce and the population that's going to attend school, they're much smaller populations. So our population growth is going to impact significantly on us all. Now Ireland is recognised as a young country, believe it or not. But if we look at the states, and this is projected to go to 2060. I don't think I'll be alive then. But anyway, if you look at 2020, there's going to be 89,000 people who will live to 100 and over. And in 2060, that's predicted to go up to 604,000 people who will be living to 100 years 
and older. But it's not ageing specifically that we're talking about because we have biological ageing and we have chronological ageing. So this lady happens to be one of my heroes. Could someone tell me what age they think she might be? If you know, you have to stay quiet. 70s, OK. OK, so this lady is 82. And she started weightlifting at 56 years of age. So there's hope for us all. She's the same age as this lady, who's also 82. So this is chronological versus biological aging. So it's not aging in itself that's the issue. It's the frailty, the challenging expression of, of aging is frailty. So I have a question for you. Which one of those would you like to be your future older self? So, what is frailty? Frailty involves a complex intermingling of biological, social, and cognitive factors that negatively impact an individual's ability to independently complete their activities of daily living. What we have is genetics, so you may be lucky in that category. But you also have environmental factors, and in that we need to talk about our our social connection, our education, our wealth, and then the environment. And that all adds to cumulative cellular damage. So if you throw in things that come along with ageing, like chronic disease, which gives you a cre decrease in your reserve, perhaps poor nutrition because you've been unwell, and decreased physical activity, you've got an increased vulnerability to this condition called frailty. So you add in a stressor event. Now that stressor event could be a change in medication, a urinary tract infection, or as severe as the death of a spouse. And the person who's starting to show signs of frailty begins to present with instability, falls, incontinence, and changes in cognition. And they then lead to increased care needs and pot potential admission to hospital. This is my favorite slide because it explains frailty very simply. So the green line is you and I. We're particularly well and fit. We get a minor illness like a urinary tract infection or a chest infection. And you can see there's a dip in the functionality where the person becomes unwell, might take to the bed a couple of days off work and feels unwell. But they return to their baseline. And all that time they remain independent unless they're my daughter there who pretends that she needs a bit more TLC and she, she was mum, I can't do, I need. But someone who's vulnerable or frail could have the exact same condition. And you can see the red line, so there is a dip in functionality. A dip in functionality. The trajectory of the illness is much longer and the return to baseline might not happen. They might just not get back to baseline. And during that time of illness, they go from being independent to dependent. So that exp explains frailty very simply. So frailty, we need to think about it. We need to understand it. We need to recognize it. And we need to plan for how we will support and care for those who are living with frailty in our community and in our hospitals. We need to future-proof the delivery of our healthcare services for those people who are going to be using it ourselves. So when I'm talking to you, I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about another group of people. I'm talking about a health service for ourselves. So frailty is a long-term condition. It shares the features of any typical long-term conditions, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's common in between 25 and 50% of people over 80. It's costly at an individual and societal level. It's typically progressive, but not always. It's potentially modifiable. Therefore, interactions with healthcare professionals are very important because we can make things better or worse depending on the care we give someone when they access our health services. And it's episodic in crisis. An episodic crisis is how the person presents. So if we consider frailty as a long-term condition, we begin to apply internationally established models and implement evidence-based care. 
That's really important because if we don't see it as a long-term condition, we'll have nothing that we can offer the person who is presenting with frailty. So this is the prevalence of frailty in our over 65-year-old population in Ireland. So I'm moving to Donegal. So you can see the difference prevalence. So it's, it's up to 28.7% on the east side of the country. But Donegal is doing something differently. I don't know what that is. It's the water up there, I think. 57% of public health nursing service users are aged 65 years older and fr old and frail. What we know is that 22% of our ED attendants are from people over 65. We know that 40% of acute medical missions are people over 65. And we know that 50% of our hospital bed days are taken up with people who are over 65. And I'd say that's quite a moderate number. I'd say it's up to 75%, particularly during the winter. We know that 5 to 6% of our older population over 65 require residential care, and that's the international trend. So we're not any different in Ireland, except for in Donegal, when it's only 2.5%. So again, I'm moving to Donegal. I had to look at this stat, though. Approximately 22% of over 85s require long-term care. This group is forecast to increase by 46% in 2021. I went back to look at this again because I thought, that's two years' time. That can't be right. But it is right. That's quite significant. Bed capacity within the nursing home sector is no longer keeping pace with increasing demand for long-term residential care. So when we're talking about this and talking about ourselves and talking about being over 65 or being over 80, we need to consider this. This is going to impact on us. And here's the demand for health services in the years to 2030. Inpatient bed days are going to increase up to 37%, which would be about 1.2 million extra. Day patient cases up to almost 30%. GP visits will be up, practice nursing visits will be up, home care packages will go up to almost 66% more. Home health hours will have increased, prescription items will have increased, and our need for physiotherapy and occupational therapy visits will have increased, and nursing home residents will have gone up a significant percentage as well. Am I depressing you now? Okay, good. We're going to get there. So this is the journey, so we're just in the middle of the storm at the moment. So I asked Google, how do you see frailty? So I'm going to ask you, can you throw me out some words that you would relate to that concept of frailty? Oh, okay, very good. That's positive. Go on, don't be afraid. I won't kill you. <laughs> Frail, what does it mean? Weak. Weak. Incapacitated. Incapacitated. Dependent. Dependent. Limited. Limited. Okay, so ask Mr. Google. Now, before I tell you what Mr. Google said, I want to tell you I've been going around to the universities to the undergraduate students and I have asked them the same thing. I've put it up on a Mentimeter, which means they put it on their phone and they can answer anonymously, so they're being very honest. And they have said exactly the same thing. So this is really, really negative. If you were to look at this, you'd think there's nothing we can do with this because it's wasting away, it's weak, it's tiny, it's shriveled. Little old lady comes up three times, but that's actually quite positive because women are going to live longer than men, so there will be more little old ladies. <laughs> Dothery, horrible, weak bones, helpless. So this is leading to the attitude and perception in 1998, the Commission on Nursing saw that working with older people was the least preferred place to work and seen as settling. So if we're going to be looking at it from that perspective, this is what's going to happen. And so the words bed blocker. There is no person in a bed in our hospital who is actually wanting to be there to block the bed. Delayed discharge, putting the fault on the patient that they have delayed their discharge. Acopia an absolutely lazy 
diagnosis, which you can do nothing with. If someone is not coping at home, there's a reason for it, and it's up to us as healthcare professionals to find out that reason. Poor historian is often written in the notes of older people. There's nothing, the person who's poor in this is the history taker. Because if an older person cannot take someone's his, or if an older person cannot give their history, you get collateral history, either from their family, from their public health nurse, from their GP, from their notes. There is no such thing as a poor historian. Pleasantly confused. There is nothing pleasant about being confused. It's patronising. And my favourite term, which I, brings me out in a rash, <laughs> elderly. Because that means somebody else. It's othering. It's that group over there. And research says that no one feels they're old. It's 15 years older than I am now. So none of us will ever, all of us in our 90s will be talking about that little old lady who's 15 years older than us. So elderly is an othering word, and we need to stop using that one. What one of those words is acceptable to your future older self? Thank you. That's the right answer. <laughs> so we're going to change the narrative. It doesn't have to be this way. So I'm going to tell you a few, th a few ways about this. So there was a geriatrician recently on Twitter, where I live half of my life, and the geriatrician was talking about the fact that the people working on his team, his interns, had no interest in working with older people and actually found them to be just something that they didn't excite them, they weren't interested in. And he said this, gerontologists are like archaeologists. They look past what others see as ruins to the beauty that lies within. And I think that's beautiful. So actually someone else on Twitter who lives in um, New Zealand put that up like that. She, she realised she spelled archaeologists wrong, but I still love it. That is now my screensaver on my computer. But again, a story like that was uh, in San Francisco a number of years ago, there was a geriatrician whose team, again, were just really negative, and he was fed up with them. They weren't interested in taking histories. They weren't interested in relationships with the older people. They didn't care what mattered to the older person. It was all about business. So he said to them, I'm coming in, and we're going to do a round together. We're going to get to know one of the, the patients on this ward, and I'm going to show you how it's done. And they all had a little snigger, because they brought him to who they felt was the most difficult little owl one. So he decided he was, that was fine, he, it was up to the challenge, so he sat down beside her and they watched and he said, how long have you been in San Francisco? And she said, years and years. And they had a little smile to themselves because she wasn't going to lead nor drive, there was going to be no relationship here. Where did you come from, he said, and she said, Ireland. When did you come? 1912. Have you ever been in hospital before? She seemed to warm up then and she said, once for a broken arm, and how did that happen, he said, and she said, a trunk fell on it. And he said, a trunk? What kind of trunk? And she said, a, a steamer trunk. And he went, hmm, and when, how did that happen? And he, she said, the boat lurched. Why did the boat lurch? It hit an iceberg. What was the name of the boat? The Titanic. No longer was this a little owl lady who was a pain in the neck. This suddenly became a person with a history. And that's the concept that the archaeologist would talk about finding the beauty beneath. So this team learned about finding out the history of the person and making them human to them. So I'm going to show you a little video. Most people are really surprised when I tell them that I'm 81 years of age. And I say, why do you say that? Down and hold. One, two, three, four, five. I want all of my people that I train to love themselves, to love their bodies. Next. I first started exercising at age 56. We don't want, you know, the big muscles. All I want is... Well, I met Ernestine about 26 years ago. She came to me, her and her sister. They wanted me to help train them to uh, get them in the exercise. And she wanted to look like me, now she looked better than me. <laughs> <laughs> We started doing aerobics first. Then from aerobics, we started lifting weights. 
It took her seven months to get ready for her first show. She just wanted to fulfill her dream, but it changed her life. I did this bodybuilding show. I came in first place. We got a call from the Guinness Book of World Records stating that they thought I was the oldest female competitive bodybuilder in the world. Last stretch on your knees. I love to do motivational speaking on exercise. I also teach many, many classes. And I meet so many wonderful people doing this particular thing. She absolutely inspires me, mainly because her journey with fitness started so late in life. I'll be 46 this Thursday, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I have the body that I wanted 20 years ago. Miss Ernestine is my mentor. I think that she's helped to save my life. I'm going to do this until my day is done. So I am not thinking of retiring anytime soon. As long as I can move my arms, move my feet, have presence of mind, I will continue this until my last breath is taken. So I could have showed you a number of videos, and in fact, I had spoken to uh, Pam and Anya because uh, I had a, a video of a 100-year-old lady as well that I could have shown you. And while, while Ernestine Shepherd, who is my hero, um, is extreme in that she's a bodybuilder, I suppose the, the idea and the message I want to get across to us is that there's never, it's never too late to start exercising. And why I'm talking to you about exercise really is around muscle mass, because when we lose muscle mass, we develop sarcopenia. And so if you look at this, it's a cross-section of a quadricep of a 74-year-old sedentary male. So you can see the adipose tissue is the white around the grey. The grey is the muscles, quite um, reduced, and then the bone mass, as you can see, is, is quite tiny. This is the muscle mass of a 40-year-old athlete. So you can see the huge difference in the muscle there. That's the muscle mass of a 70-year-old triathlete. Now, I don't want you all to be triathletes. What I'm saying to you is exercise is really important. It's really important for your future older self. Let's have a look at that then. We peak at our strength in muscle around 45 years of age, but the upper line is the person who continues on exercising, and you can see the gradual decrease as they move on. Obviously, you are <laughs> going to reduce muscle as you age, but you can maintain it, versus the person who at 45 peaks and doesn't do anything. So you can see that, and then that leads to the threshold of disability. Happens sooner, and the other person stays fit. So we have a responsibility to our bodies. And just to give you a little plug, we're doing a national campaign, Get Up, Get Dressed, Get Moving, and Thomas Kearns here is a huge ambassador for this and is supporting us to do it. Because if we don't use our muscles, we're going to lose them. We started off because we could see that happening in hospitals where people are deconditioning, but even mental health where they're doing Move Your Mood in Waterford are seeing people reducing their anxiety and depression by 40% and we need to get people up and moving at home, even if that's only sit to stand, because that's all they can do. It builds their capacity. So stay strong, people. And just around that, one study highlighted that 65% of older people were deconditioned after just two days of being in hospital. And of those, 67% failed to improve and 10% deteriorated further. So get up, get dressed, get moving in hospital. Older people in hospital have a 23% risk of being unable to return home and require nursing home placement simply because they've lost the ability in some of their basic activities of daily living, even during a short hospitalisation. So now I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about elderly or another group of people. I'm talking about us going into hospital and one in four of us not going home. That's not good enough. Look at the person beside you. Every second person in hospital becomes incontinent within 24 hours of hospital admission, of older people, I mean. Is that acceptable to your future older self? 
So why would it be acceptable to older people today? So let's talk a little bit about diet and frailty. So loss of muscle mass or strength with unintentional weight loss and then loss of muscle function, which we've already talked about, causes malnutrition, which in itself leads to frailty. Physical frailty is a nutrition-related condition, so our diet is hugely important. So these two people are malnourished. Obviously, the top one looks very obviously malnourished, and this lady is also likely to have sarcopenia and frailty. But the obese person is also malnourished. So a healthy weight is really important for your future older self. A little bit of data. So every malnourished person costs over €5,000 to the health service every year. 25% to 34% of hospital admissions, so people admitted to hospital, are at risk of malnutrition. We all know that. The bed tray is left at the end of the bed. People aren't being fed. That leads to longer stays, more complications, more support needed after discharge and more likely to need care. 70% of patients weigh less going home. I think I might go to hospital, actually. <laughs> and that leads to more GP visits, more prescriptions and more hospital admissions. So improving diet can help to slow the process or the progression of the disease of ageing. So TILDA, the longitudinal study on ageing, is phenomenal. It is Irish and it's really one of the best international longitudinal studies in the world. They have 8,000 plus over 50-year-olds who are attending every two years to have a health assessment done, which is giving us so much information. It is a ratio of 1 to 157 people in Ireland over 50. That those odds like are huge, so it's giving such rich data. So what it's telling us is that one in seven people in Ireland do not comply with the recommendation of the food pyramid. Are you guilty? Three in four people do not get their five a day of fruit and vegetables. Two in three consume one or more servings of food high in fat, salt and sugar. One in eight are vitamin D deficient and that increases to one in four during the winter. And it's more common in those who live in the north and west of the country, so maybe we won't go to Donegal. Those who are overweight, those who are less physically active, those who smoke and those who live alone. But this information isn't out there just for the sake of it. This gives you the power, the knowledge, to know how to have a good diet and to remain well so your future older self is a well person. So cognition, then. Cognition involves the use of multiple brain processes, your perception, your memory, your reasoning, your decision making, and your problem solving. So it's quite complex. Disruption to these processes can compound the presence of other frailty syndromes, and cognition is a relevant domain of frailty. And we would know that with dementia, but also cognitive impairment. So another video, so I'll stop talking. <coughs> what can you do to keep your brain healthy? We all know high cholesterol isn't good for our bodies, along with high blood pressure and being overweight. But what you might not know is that not only can these health concerns shorten the life of your body, they can affect your brain function. The more scientists study our brains, the more they're finding that how well it works is intricately tied to the health of our body. For example, just 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times a week can keep your brain sharp. Because physical exercise not only helps your heart, it can increase the size of your hippocampus, a part of the brain crucial to making memories. But that's not all. Physical exercise generates a chemical called EDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which acts like fertilizer for the brain, encouraging the growth of neural connections and new brain cells. So, obviously staying active is important, but not just physically active. You need to keep socially active as well, especially as you get older because there's growing evidence to suggest that people who can avoid getting lonely reduce their risk of cognitive decline, something we all agree is a good thing. But there's one last thing you need to do to keep your brain healthy. 
keep it active. So, in no particular order, here are three top ways to keep your brain stimulated. Number one, challenge yourself. The satisfaction you get from doing things slightly beyond your comfort zone actually changes your brain chemistry, making you feel more positive. Number two, change yourself. Novelty helps your brain, so it's good to experience new things, take on new situations and meet new people. And number three, learn something new. This encourages the growth of new brain cells and stimulates the connections between them, which has its own benefits because stronger brain connections also help keep your brain healthy. So don't let age stop you from doing the things you love. Think young, because if you look after your brain now, keeping it active and engaged, it will make you proud for years to come. One of the things that I heard from Tilda yesterday was in relationship to activity, volunteering in Ireland, and we are very good at volunteering. We stop at 75. So we were asking, is that because we're ageist towards ourselves or other people tell us that we no longer can do it? So do not let age get in your way. It's not the biological ageing, it's the chronological ageing we need to be What can you on. do? This lady is Irish and in the snow, was it two or three years ago? She decided she was going to bargaining. She's 76, that's her grandson. And there's a photograph that was on Twitter where I said I lived most of my life. Going slaying down the hill, isn't that just a picture of joy? And that's the 76-year-old I am going to be. <laughs> we're all going to age and soften and mellow and transition, all of us if we're lucky. There's plenty of things to be anti about. Anti-discrimination, anti-drug, anti-oppression, anti-poverty and anti-sickness. Ageing isn't one of them. We need to become pro-ageing and embrace the opportunities that ageing provides. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. That was a really thought-provoking and insightful presentation on ageing. It's something that's going to affect all of us in some way or another. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor to questions and anybody that might have questions for Deirdre. Can I start? Okay. I don't want to hug the floor. Um, you were talking about them going into hospital and, you know, sort of not, re not regaining their, their, their level of activity and um, increasing their frailty. Does that, you know, is, is that a, as a direct result of their confidence? You know, sort of, do they lose confidence when they go into hospital? Um, so it's quite idiopathic, really, because what we do in hospital is we, we're risk averse. And so Sorry, we, we assess people for risk of falls. And when they're at risk of falls, they are not allowed to move. Mm -hmm. And a lovely story I will give you on this. So my dad is in a, a nursing home. He's got dementia. And before he was admitted, he went to the day service in this nursing home. And the nurse there was really terrified that one of her clients was going to fall. So she kept telling them all to sit. Now, my father played golf every day of his life. So he, sitting is just not in his vocabulary. But the CNM one day just got had enough of this. So she came on duty and he said, Mary, sit down. And she sat down and she got up. No, Mary, sit down. This went on for two or three hours till Mary went. <laughs> and she said, what are you at all this sitting down? And he said, what does it feel like? This is what you're doing. And this is what we do in hospital. And so we reduce people's um, activity. So in St. Vincent's University Hospital, someone put a pedometer on um, patients in, in the care of the older person ward. And the most active was the person. So when you mobilise at home, but if you go into hospital or into any care, you're, sort of, you're now wandering. So it changes from mobilising to wandering. Mm -hmm. So this person was now wandering and they did 700 steps. So 700 steps, what kind of activity level is that? And so, so we do, we, we de decondition, and then our environment in hospital. So when I trained as a nurse in St. Vincent's, hello, Jerry, um, she was my tutor. <laughs> <laughs> You're too. <laughs> she was great. Um, so 
We had day, day wards and the patients walked to day wards and they would eat and meet families. We don't have them anymore, so there's no place to, act, to act, actively go to. And then everything is so cluttered now. So we actually need to age, attune our, work, our, our hospital environments particularly. Residential care settings are very good at this. It's their bread and butter because they have a gerontological attuned head on them anyway. And so they're focusing on the older adults and how to improve their quality of life. So yes. That's, we actually cause harm mm -hmm. and we need to look at reducing function as a harm. It's the same as falls, it's the same as pressure ulcers, it's the same as infections. It needs to be managed and, and we need to record the data on that so that we can actually look at what we're doing to our older people. No. Thomas. <laughs> I have a question for Mark right here. <laughs> 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 can you elaborate on the point you talked about get up, get up, get up, get up. Can you tell me, because I know, I know a little bit about drugs, but tell the audience the, the nature of the work, it's interdisciplinary nature obviously, but some of the stuff that, that's going on in relation to that campaign. So in, in internationally there's a, a gentleman called Brian Dolan, many of you might have heard of him. He's done a social media whole concept around a thing called end PJ paralysis. He's even won an OBE for it. And in Ireland, a number of different hospitals and champions in different hospitals have decided they were going to introduce get up, get dressed, get moving or end PJ paralysis in their hospitals. And it survived as long as that person was championing it. And it survived for a period of time, for a challenge period of time. But it never became the way we do business. So because we knew there were so many good people out there doing it, myself and Thomas had a chat and Tom, Tom was talking to Brian Dolan and we decided what we would do is offer people the opportunity to come together and form a network. Initially we put out an email and we got 116 people from across the whole sector. So residential care, mental health, intellectual disabilities, uh, education, um, hospitals, where else? NGOs, so the Age Alliance, who am I missing? Hello. Alone, yes. So an awful lot of people came together and we had a meeting and we said, how are we going to do this? So I have to get comfortable with this word emerge because we don't know what it's going to look like. So, But we know the answer is going to be in the room when we bring people who are passionate together. And so the answer was in the room. Now we have four work, working groups. One is defining what get up, get dressed, get moving looks like because that means different thing to me at home than it does to someone in a residential setting to someone who's in an intensive care unit. You should be getting people. So they do a thing called a daily dangle in a lot of ICUs where they get the person's legs dangled over the side, even if they're intubated. And that has reduced lengths of stay in ICUs. So we know that it's, so Kilkenny, for example, St. Luke's and Kilkenny have done it. The Matter have done it. Beaumont have done it. And they have all come back with really positive data about reduced lengths of stay, reduced falls, reduced infections, reduced complaints and people going home. So we knew all that. So now we have these working groups. So defining it, then the resources. So we know there's a huge amount of resources. And we have a, a group called Seal Blue who've just joined us. We have Health and Wellbeing have just joined us. We've asked the National Ambulance Service to join us. <laughs> Intensive Care Program is So all of these people are, are coming on board. And we are going to amalgamate all the resources and have them for a hub so that people at home will know how to get up, get dressed, get moving. Their carers will know and healthcare professionals will know. And then we have uh, uh, Thomas is supporting a summit on the 23rd of January. Brian Dolan's going to come to that and we're going to launch the Irish Get Up, Get Dressed, Get Moving. But in order to do that, we're going out for consultation. We're, we're having four workshops nationally and we're asking older people, the general public, and healthcare professionals to come together and design what would get up, get dressed, get moving Ireland look like. Because we don't want healthcare professionals going out and saying this is what we're going to do because it won't work. We need to understand what motivates people to exercise or motivates them not to exercise. So sitting is the new smoking and loneliness is one of the worst things that can happen and if you're interested in reading more of that, Tilda's latest report on loneliness is, is just so insightful. And you're all invited, by the way, because the faculty is hosting this in partnership with the Office for the Nursing and Human Services Director and indeed our colleagues in the Health and Social Care Professionals in HSE. And it's here in the, in the faculty on the 23rd of... There's only 200 places to sign up soon. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any made any 
any connections with the affinity program then as well? Yeah, so yes, yeah, of course we have. So, I mean, anybody who has anything to do, so the affinity program is a national falls program in Ireland, and so we have the falls program. So anybody who has anything to do with the whole concept of mobility and, and falls, health and well-being, all of those different people. So there's I think we've about 250 names on the network now, and we're starting to get more and more, which is fantastic. And again, it's healthcare professionals who are coming into a room in their own time, going home. So one of the one of the examples on this was the education working group. They decided to do a literature review. So two healthcare professionals, one an OT in Mayo, the other one a nurse in Navan, never met each other before started interacting with each other in email and did a literature review. And from that, we're going to have a leadership programme developed. Like, phenomenal. Healthcare professionals are just phenomenal. And this, that's why I have the best job in Ireland, because I get to work with these people who don't get paid for doing this extra stuff. They're just passionate. Resources. Mm. You know, and, and resourceful. Yeah, you know, resourceful. Sort of, um, yeah, yeah. Using um, or maximising resources. You'd like to ask a question? I should introduce myself. I'm Ewer Shelley, and um, I'm a retired public health physician, which I have the privilege of uh, working on the Order of Peoples programme uh, before we joined it. And I have to say, um, she brought, for the considerable enthusiasm she brings to it, um, and you know, it wasn't always plain sailing, but I think some of her nurse managers times eased the way for her and then there was this wonderful um, building of a network of parental education. So I'd love you to tell people who may not know all about that work, what you've been doing prior to what you're describing now. How did you open the doors? <laughs> <laughs> Push them. Um, <laughs> so. The, there's a number of clinical programs in, in Ireland. One of them is the emergency medicine program, and then there's the acute medicine program. So they are the front door, the acute floor in the hospital. And the program leads there wanted to look at developing a foundation program for nurses who are going to work in emergency medicine or acute medicine. So they were asking them a number of questions about what do you need. So I put in three questions. Have you, ever had frailty have you ever had education on frailty screening, cognition assessment, or comprehensive geriatric assessment? And a small number of them had said yes. And that was fine, because even if it was a small number, because frailty is really a new science, and we're all starting to learn about it. But the second question we asked was, do you need education in cognitive assessment, frailty assessment, and comprehensive geriatric assessment? Now, comprehensive geriatric assessment is the gold standard of care for someone with frailty. And 12 to 20 per cent said that they needed that education. So my hair fell out. And we decided, OK, so there's either older people not presenting to our acute floors, but that's not what the data is saying, or there's something wrong. So we decided there was something wrong. So we looked to develop a national frailty education programme. And the national frailty education programme is delivered in partnership with the TILDA. So it's translating the research they have and translating it into practice. And we have interprofessional networks who deliver it. So each hospital and its CHO has MDT, so multidisciplinary teams, who are, who are delivering the programme to multidisciplinary teams. So they don't just bring it to the hospital and deliver it to their themselves. They get CHO, they get the private nursing home, they get volunteers, they get porters, they get everybody to come into the room and they start discussing frailty. Within the first year, these facilitators had 2,200 people through the programme. They're almost, it's like the church of frailty, they become evangelic. Because when you know frailty and understand it, you cannot go back to letting someone sit down. You cannot go back to the way you used to work. So we are just Three hospitals left and the whole country is completed. We're on the next revision of it because TILDA has new information because their last wave has gone through. And so we have a new revision of the National Frailty Education Programme so that when you are 65 or 80 and maybe slightly frailer, that you will actually have the best care possible. Thank you. And I attended a policy seminar in Stoke on Monday of this week. And it was very interesting. 
testing that the supposed to find when curing um, intellectual disability services. But the champions and the biggest take home message for me was the group who actually call themselves Calico Biz University of Home, uh, not Donegal, the other part of it. Um, it is from their perspective on the provision of palliative care services for persons with an intellectual disability. So it's back to that part where you actually say, finding the history of the person, finding the cure, meaning the cure. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. And I have to say, I have learned so much from the Registered Nurse and in Intellectual Disabilities that I never knew before. And so people with an intellectual disability start ageing from 25. And we do not pay any attention. We talk about over 65 years. And with the National Frailty Education Programme, we have intellectual disability nurses who are leading out on that, so they keep reminding us. So Neve Walsh in Donegal has me slapped around the head any time I slip on that. We have so much to learn from the RNID about person-centred care that it actually is humbling how much we didn't recognise that. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I'd like person-led care. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just ask one more question? You, you were mentioning in your, at the start of your presentation that the population is decreasing in terms of, of age, you know, sort of, um, and they, the increasing older people. Is there a sort of a move afoot to recognise that deficit whenever we get to the... Uh, 2046 when there is going to be a, a huge... Um so um, the work that we're doing within the National Clinical and Integrated Care programmes is around that. So Dr Siobhan Connelly has just been appointed as a National Clinical Advisory Group Lead. So she's a geriatrician and she is responsible then for the governance around older people and that includes palliative care because we all are going to die eventually. Mm -hmm. So we do need to have good death. We need to talk about that as well. We can't ignore that. Um, and so Sláinte Care is a 10-year plan. And I, it does give me great hope because it means it's not reliant on any politician to come in and change what they're doing. So I think a 10-year plan is really important. And it's talking about shifting left, shifting to home. And we've been talking about that since I can, since Ger, you taught me. We've been talking about that forever and a day. <laughs> but I do believe that's the way Slauncha Care is. And I also believe one of the catalysts is the Chief Nursing Office in the Department of Health. And I think that Claire Lewis and Tanya King um, and Rachel in there as well are, are doing so much about bringing nursing to that end. And one of the other pieces I'm doing is looking at the nursing posi a position paper with the Chief Nurse in the South and the Chief Nurse in the North, a nursing position paper on the ageing population and what we can do to influence better outcomes for older people as nurses. So that hopefully will move into a strategy for our gerontological nursing in the future. I was talking to students in um, Trinity and in Limerick in the last two weeks. They don't want to work with older people. They are socialised so negatively around working with older people and we need to change that. So that's one of my, I'm going around to the universities to speak to them all at undergraduate level to tell them about the wonderful career it can be but are beginning to realise we need to go to them actually in school. Transition. Yeah, so we need to get them in school. So uh, there'll have to be a few more of me to go around and do that. But, um, but it's our responsibility as, as citizens of this country to not accept ageist language, to not accept ageist behaviour, and not to accept poor outcomes just because someone is over 65, because what you condone, you permit. Yeah? Can I Looking at it, you're talking about over 65, but obviously that, that is all of us. But surely that's getting a little late. Should we not be stepping that back and talking, having this conversation sort of in our 40s uh, and, and moving it forward from there? Yeah, and so one of the things that I think that nursing will be doing in the future particularly will be around, um, around uh, health promotion and health education because from your 45, you start to lose your, your muscle mass unless you do something about it. And I think information is power.
And I think so. A number of the people we've spoken to who are, who are take, using services in healthcare have said, "I want to manage my own care. You just need to inform me how to do that." And so, yes, we need to be doing that from a young age. So now, the work that they're doing in the obesity program that add no more treats, like that's all really important and influential for because that's their future older self. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need to be talking about it much younger. And that's why I put the slant on this talk tonight because it could have been telling you everything about frailty, but. I wanted to tell you a bit more about how to your future older self. So, so the National Frailty Education Programme is to try and target that, is to give people information about how to do things better. And understanding frailty as a long-term condition means you apply those concepts of long-term care or conditions to that person. And so we're working with Alone. They have a lot of volunteers. So Alone have stopped their volunteers going in and making the tea and going shopping. They've got the volunteers to get the person to make them a cup of tea and take them shopping tiny little nuance mm -hmm. but a huge difference in how we approach things and it's again it's about understanding it so that we've we're starting to deliver the national frailty education program to the alone volunteers and my vision in the future would be that we would have a a program for the general public that we'd be going into active aging groups would be going into retirement groups would be going to any of those groups and we'd be saying here's the information this is your power you take it so yes we, No. No. You were given a scale of one to hundred. You'd probably say five percent to match some of the items that you mentioned. Yes, and I would say that those people don't understand frailty. I would say we haven't we haven't reached them yet, and we need to. So the frailty education program is only going two and a half years. Um, we have about 2,400 people through it now, but there's a lot more to get through. So it's about just keeping on going, and eventually we'll have a critical mass of people who will no longer tolerate sitting or making people sit or not providing the, the correct care. But it'll have to be when we get a critical mass. And so you go home now, or any of us will go home and we'll be with, with relatives and we'll start saying, why don't you have a boiled egg instead of bread and jam? Let's have your protein improved. Have you been taking a vitamin D supplement because you haven't been out for a long time? Those little tiny things. So we can't change everything. And I talk to public health nurses who say, you know, we're not even screening for frailty. But I give them information on delirium and polypharmacy, and they might sometimes say to me, well, the drugs are the doctor's issue. And I go, well, no, because if someone suddenly becomes confused, you need to ask, is there a new drug there? Or if they're suddenly confused, is it delirium and not that, there's, that they have dementia? And in knowing that, you can do something, something different until we're at the stage where everybody's talking about it. Essentially highlighting all of the levels of health promotion, primary, mm -hmm. secondary, mm -hmm. and tertiary, mm -hmm. and at all levels and yeah. at all ages, you know, yes. sort of to, to look to the future. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about us understanding mm -hmm. that we have a responsibility to our future older self, mm -hmm. and it's about older people understanding that it's not too late, it's mm -hmm. never too late, mm -hmm. and that frailty is progressive but not always, and that you can actually halt mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. to a level. Thomas, you can ask about oh, Thomas. <laughs> really impressive in terms of all the, the data and all the research, and it, it's really stark, okay? And it's not because I'm <clears throat> close to that age or anything, but it is really stark from the perspective of how small changes can make a huge mm. difference. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied that some of this important data coming from Tilden and other sources is influencing health policy, number one? And number two, is there an economic analysis of the potential of this, these simple changes to affect our health budget, our health spending? Because my, my, my thought on this is if we can get a value on this that's economic, we can make those who are the payers in terms of health service development and living to sit up and listen. Mm -hmm. It makes infinite sense. But if we can put a value on this and indeed a cost on the alternative, is that something that you think is being done effectively? Do you think there is that clear link between this clear evidence and the economic cost associated with us 
or future aging cell? So two answers for you. One is in relationship to one tiny little change that happened because of tilde information. So someone's walking speed is a huge indicator of their level of frailty. So in populations where there's a high demographic of people with slow walking speeds, based on the tilde research, they've changed the traffic light system. So the orange man stays on longer. So you'll see some areas you think, oh, God, I can get across because some, the demographic of people in that area with slow walking speeds is higher. So that is one of the things that's come out of Tilda, which I think that's beautiful. Mm. In relationship to costing, so I've just at the, I was at the Department of Health and the people from um, New Zealand, Canterbury, where they've got an amazing integrated system there, were talking about costs and how they saved 80 million by putting in 10. So we know the costs. We know, we know, we know, we know. But we are so hospital-centric. And as that lady in, from Canterbury said today, if we don't put Thomas in the centre of it and let the hospital be on the periphery where it needs to be, because how often will you spend time there? You'll only be there when you need to. And we need to stop using it as the go-to. So there's people in the community who end up in an, uh, an acute um, an emergency medicine department because they need a commode because that's the only way they're going to get a home care package. Like, that is criminal. We shouldn't be, and there's an awful lot of people who are admitted. So if you're 75, you'll be twice as likely to be admitted. If you're 93, you'll three times be likely to be admitted than someone under 65 just because of your age, because you have a junior clinician who's afraid not to admit you. The question needs to be, is there a risk in admitting you, not in, is there a risk to sending you home? Well, maybe that's for nursing, advanced nursing yes. and Yeah, and an, and another thing we're looking at, Liz, in relationship to advanced practice, is advanced practice in GP surgeries, because there's a huge burden, and we know that we've, GPs are running out the door; they're exhausted, and there's an awful lot of missed. We could have huge, we could have databases on frailty. We could have an awful lot of information using the skills that nursing have. So nursing can be a huge part of the solution. I'm just wondering, in, in some areas in the UK, they, they, you know, where there's problems, they bring in ambassadors for particular, you know, sort of, I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, maybe HR issues, you know, sort of they bring in ambassadors. Would there be the potential for the development of ambassadors for aged care within the hospitals to advocate, you know, all of what you're saying and, and also bring more junior nursing staff into, you know, sort of... Um, increase their passion about caring for, for elderly people? You know, is it a, a, a possibility for the future that they could look at something like that, having a, a passionate individual in, 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 that maybe would straddle both community and the, mm -hmm. the, the hospitals mm -hmm. to facilitate that transition and also reintegration back afterwards, yeah. you know, sort of after that sort so, of... So there's a case manager role which is based in the community and so... Um, Claire Lewis, who's now in the Department of Health, was in CHO9 in Beaumont, and she developed a virtual ward. So she had an orange, uh, she had a traffic light system. So someone who was green was someone who was going back to the public health nurse and, and quite well. Someone who was orange was at a risk of either deteriorating or was needing some more support than they had been. And someone who was red was most likely going to need hospital care and needed to be on her books. And so she would have managed and navigated and signposted that person's care. So it could be that they were admitted, but she got them back out quickly so they weren't in deconditioning in hospital because she was able to refer them to a falls clinic or to a day hospital or link in with the GP. So that's the kind of concept in the community about case management roles. And we were talking earlier, so I had a meeting earlier with a number of um, people who represent older people. We were doing a, a workshop around the position paper for gerontological nursing and how it's going to, it can be a solution to the, to the issues we're having. And the older people talked about the fact that we need to mentor our young nurses because we're, we're, we're giving them the wrong message and we're asking them to work with very complex people because older people are complex. They have a number of comorbidities and a lot going on and then everybody else is afraid they're going to fall and you're trying to stand up and advocate for them and, and say, no, they should be allowed to walk, they should be allowed to go home, all of those different things. And how do you do that as a, as a junior staff nurse or a younger person in, in our services. So we need to be mentoring more. And I would go so far as 
I know this has been recorded, but I would go so far as to say that we actually need to have a whole concept, a pathway of gerontological training and an education and a pathway of specialism if we're going to be able to manage this. Now, older people are everywhere, so we can't specialise too much that we don't have people understanding frailty and, and how people uh, age and ageing well. But I do think we, need to we do need to give it that kudos of, of its specialism as well. And I just lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly two generations who haven't lived in a house where they had three generations in the home. Absolutely. Whereas my grandparents would have had three generations in the home. So they grew up around older people. It was happy. it was part of their norm to have the older person within the family. But now everyone is in their separate little silos. The older person's over there, the younger families are mm. there, the kind of families with the kids going off to the empty nest or yeah. another group. They're never all in the one place at the same time. Yeah, we call that progress. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's always a progress, well, but it's not. Yeah. If you think about when we, well, I think about when I trained St. James's, you were lucky if you had a patient under 40. If you had a patient under 40, you thought there was something wrong. But that was my norm. Mm. And by God, if there was patients sitting for more than an hour in a chair, the student nurse was in trouble. Mm. It was your job to get them dressed, get them up, and get them moving, and we did. And they were walked, we were walked, legs were walked up, up and down yeah. hospital yeah. bed, which used to take yeah. 10 minutes to walk the length of the corridor. Yeah. But, <laughs> but now we don't have the student nurse to do that. Mm. We gave away some of that. When you were doing that, you were doing assessment of the level of activity, you were assessing the patient's frailty, you were assessing their cognition, you were <laughs> Our family history, our medical history. We don't do that anymore. Because behind the curtain doing the bed bath, it's not the nurse anymore. And when you're vulnerable in a bed with no clothes on, being washed by somebody, the conversation becomes quite in depth a lot of the time. And that was where the nurse learned about her patient. And we've given that away. Mm -hmm. We're stuck looking at computers. Yeah. And uh, have you read Being Mortal by Atul Gandhi? I'd highly recommend that. He talks about ageing and he talks about the progress that we have in that we, you know, the children leave and you give the house to yourself now. We no, no longer have the community. And they say it takes a community to raise a child, it takes a community to keep an older adult at home, and we have lost that. But we, we need to know that and we need to talk about that and we need to challenge that for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to do that. <laughs>